I want to read in our hearing the scriptures again. We'll mention them, and you could follow in your Bible. Uh, John chapter 10, verse 10. John chapter 7, verse 37 to 39. And Matthew 28, verse 16 to 20. And I will just, in the interest of time, read again the passage from John chapter 7, beginning at verse 37. It says, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him will receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Today, we want to meditate on the baptismal fount. Open thou, O God, the fountain of life, and in thy light we shall see light. Thank you for the promise that righteousness will spring forth today. And truth, mighty God, just as the seed planted in the garden, so righteousness, so you will cause righteousness and truth to spring forth in the earth today. Thank you for the word now planted in our heart. And thank you for the fruits of righteousness and truth manifested in the life of your people everywhere. Oh, blessed Lord, we need you. Apart from you, this ministry, Lord, would have no value. And God, we want to be, Lord, that people that are useful instrument in your hand in these last days. You promised to make of us, God, a new sharp threshing instrument with teeth. We present our bodies today as living sacrifice, that the reality, Lord, of your instruments might be made manifest in the midst of us, that your work might go forth today as you have ordained. Bless your people, Lord, and cause the word to find, Lord, good ground, good soil. Thank you that the strong man is now bound today, Lord. And we give you thanks and praise for the liberty of the Lordship of the Spirit of God. We thank you, Lord. Now, last week we talked a little bit about the Christ and the Antichrist. We spoke about Christ being the order of God and the Antichrist um, the order of Satan. And we say it, when we speak about Christ as the order in which God reveals himself, we say, we said, we start with righteousness or right standing with God. And then we talk about life coming out of this right relationship with God then light, then an ordering of all things, fruitfulness, love, and glory. We said when we talk about the Lord as God's order of revealing himself, these are the things that we are trying to get a vision of. These are the things that God wants us to understand. That in Christ as God's order, these things are, are paramount, right, in our understanding, in the vision of Christ as the order of God. And we said, as the Antichrist, as the order that Satan reveals himself, that he starts out with unrighteousness, rebellion, independence from God. 
and the end is the wrath of God. So last week we tried to focus on these two aspects of these two kingdoms. And I want to say to us today that in every one of these steps, there is a war going on. There is righteousness uh, against unrighteousness. There is life against death. There is light against darkness. There is order against chaos. There is fruitfulness against barrenness. There is love against iniquity and glory against wrath. And so we see this fight going on in all of these realms. And see, in any moment, even as Christians, we could find ourselves being used of the enemy if we fulfill the condition for Satan to work. And so it's important for us to understand that the conflict that between these two kingdoms goes on in every realm, starting with right standing with God and ending with the glory of God. And brothers and sisters, when we talk about what God is after, it's important that we stay in the order of God. Because whenever we step out of that order of God, then we find ourselves in disorder, in chaos, and headed for wrath, even as Christians. So we are to encourage us this morning to keep all this in mind when we talk about spiritual warfare, when we talk about the conflict in which we find ourselves, we want to keep this in mind. Now, today, we want to look at this um, conflict between life and death. But really, we want to focus more on life. We want to focus more on Christ Jesus now, the order of God, and this whole notion of life. Now, he says, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. We saw that in John chapter 10. And this life now has to overcome death. See, we look at things now as if though everything is alive and, and the trees and, and the birds, even us. But we don't understand that the principle working in everything is death. And the only reason why that these things are alive is because life is continually overcoming death. So it seems like, you know, the scripture said from Adam until Moses, death reigned. You know, and, and so as believers, as those who are seeking after God, we have to understand that the way we normally look at things is as if though everything is alive and then death now overtakes. But that's not true. The real situation thing is that death is actually preeminated in the world in which we live. And life now overcomes death. How we could say that? The very sun that provides nourishment, let's say. See, if there is no life, if the life principle no longer works, that very sun will cause things to rot. The air will cause things to spoil. The very water that you drink will bring death if that life principle is not working in us. As soon as 
There is no life in a body. We see the rot. We see the decay setting in. And everything that was promoting, that we thought was promoting life now, becomes the source of the manifestation of death. So we see life now as a principle always overcoming death. And you know, the Bible says that death is our last enemy. Death is our last enemies. And brothers and sisters, do not just think of death as the end of life. Think of death as the result of sin, but as separation from the life of God. And so there's a process in dying. It's like dying, you will die. In other words, there's a process. And so many things in our life manifest this process, this dying, even while we are alive. In every realm, in our bodies, in our souls, even our spirit, this death is manifested. Now the Lord says, I am come that you might have life. I am come that you might have life and have it in abundance. And so this morning, let's look a little bit about this second principle in Christ as the order of God, this whole notion of life. Now, in the Bible, life is comparable to a river. The Bible uses a river often to try to get us to understand what life is all about. And so let's look at the river. First, the river starts, it has a beginning. And normally it starts in a mountain somewhere, melting ice and all that stuff, or melting glacier. The river has a source, it has a beginning. That's the first thing we want to look at. Then a river has banks. In other words, it's constrained on both sides. It has banks. It does not flow willy-nilly everywhere. And then when you talk about a river, you're talking about movement. There's always movement in the river. It's always flowing. And then a river has a destination. It always ends. Uh, somewhere in the sea or somewhere, a lake, whatever, it has a destination where it ends up. Now, let's look spiritually at the river. The first thing, the source. We see in Ezekiel this river flowing from the altar, from underneath the altar, underneath the door. It's flowing out and it goes in a particular direction. We're going to come back to that. We see in Revelation that this river flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now we see God is the source of this river. When we talk about life as a river, we want to say that God is the source. And see, this river have banks. And the Bible says, the spirit goes where he wants. It flows according to the will of God. God directs it. It's constrained by the will of God. Where God wants this river to flow, that river flow. And now it's important that we understand that in this flow of the river, it's according to the will of God. We cannot determine where the river will flow or where it goes. It follows the will of God. And, and that's important when we talk about revival, when we're talking about movements in, in, in time, when we're talking about what God is doing in individual life. The river flows according to the will of God. And then it's always flowing. It's always movement. There is no stagnation. See, if the spirit of life is in us 
and in the midst of us, it, it overcomes all those things that hinder this, this movement, this life, this aliveness in God. The river flows now from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And you know, it's constrained, it's bounded, it flows in Christ. It flows from him, this, this, this life, this anointing river of God. And then it flows back into God. So it comes from God and it goes back into God. From God, through Christ, and back into God. So this river now is, has its source. It is bounded. It's in Christ, the movement of God in Christ. It flows, brothers and sisters. It goes according to the will of God, and then it goes back into God, this river of life. Now, we want to look at the work of this river of life. We're talking about the Spirit. Remember the Lord said he was talking about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And I want us to try to tie this river of life into the work of the Spirit of God. When we look in John chapter 16, it says that the Spirit, when he comes, would convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because they believed not in the name of the Lord. Of righteousness because he's gone to the Father. And of judgment because the prince of this world has been judged. Now, also, we find that in John 16, it says that he will show us the things of Christ. He will show those things. He will reveal them to us. And so you find that this river, as it flows, it, it kind of strengthens the saints. It causes us to, to grow. It causes us to, to see the things of Christ. This river, it also works on the saints, not just on the world. See, the river flows from the throne of God, but it also flows in, in the midst of the congregation. And it, it has a particular purpose for the saints. So we need the river as much or even more than the, the, the world as, it does, as he does his work in the world. So we want to look at those two aspects to see if we can come to grips with what we mean when we talk about the river as the baptismal fount. Now, in John 7, again, it says, out of our innermost being, out of our belly, will flow this river. Now, remember that the river is for the saints, and the river is also for the world, is for both. This river he's talking about is the Holy Spirit, and it flows out of our innermost being. You gotta pray, brothers and sisters, because you know the battle rages in every realm and in every dimension. Now, what is this river? What is this movement of God? What is the manifestation that is going to flow out of us? In order to try to get a handle of it, we want to go to um, the passage that we read in Matthew 28, 16 to 20. God gave a command to the disciples, to the eleven. He says, go ye into all the world and make disciples. You go preach the word, make disciples. And he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Ghost. Now, what we normally do is just take that as a mode of baptism. And so it, 
there's a lot of um, discussions among different groups about the form of baptism because we limited it to just the natural. I believe God wants us to see something different. He wants us to see that this river that flows in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Ghost is something spiritual. See, what is the name of the Father? What do we mean by that? It's his character, it's his nature. So when Moses asks the Lord to see him, let me see you, the God warned him about what he was asking for. But he told him, you know, I'm going to let you see something of me, of my goodness. And then he passed before Moses and he said, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, full of goodness and truth. He decided to declare his name. And then the Lord says about me, he says, I am meek. I'm humble. He says, I am the true and faithful witness. He says, I am obedient to my father. So when we talk about the name of the Lord, we're talking about meekness in a spiritual sense. We're talking about humility. We're talking about obedience. And we're talking about faith. Now, Look at the Holy Spirit. The Lord says he is the spirit of truth. He's the spirit of power. He's the spirit of glory. He's the spirit of, of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Now think about those three aspects they, uh, of, of this river. The name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Ghost. Now this river is flowing out of you and I. When Christ Jesus is thrown, enthroned in the heart. From the throne of God and of the Lamb. This river is supposed to be flowing out of you and I. The spiritual river. And so the first thing we want to look at when we're talking about this baptismal fount, is you and I being in a condition, being in a right relationship with God so that this river of mercy, of grace, of goodness, of justice flows out of us. And that it flows out of us as a river, a source. It has boundaries. It has a purpose. And, and, and God says, when you are believing into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and walking in the love shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, out of your innermost being will flow this river. Now what this river does, it's supposed to baptize it's supposed to baptize. It's supposed to submerge in this spiritual uh, fountain, this spiritual flow that's coming out of us. It's supposed to subvert, submerge the, the saints. And let's look at what this submersion does. See, there's two aspects of the Holy Spirit that we need to come to grips with. The Lord said to the disciples, he is in you and he will always be upon you. He says that you will receive power when he comes to, upon you to be my witnesses. So let's look at what this river does to the saints. When this river flows out of us and submerges us, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Then the heavenly dove have a place to put his feet. Remember, he is holy. And he does not come upon the flesh. So when this anointing, you remember the Lord said 
the, 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 the spirit of the living God is upon me because he has anointed me. Well, this anointing, this river of the nature of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost flows out of us. And we are anointed. And then the heavenly dove have a place to put his feet. And what that does? It strengthens us. It gives us the strength, the power we need to be faithful witnesses of Christ. Faithful martyr of Christ. That our witness now become faithful. It means that we are always now reflecting Christ. And our testimony has spirit. It comes spirit and life. The word that we speak now is spirit and life. Now that's important. It, important for us to, as Christians to understand the flow of life from us. It's so important in everything that we do as Christians. We need this anointing. But not only flowing out of us, flowing upon us. Remember Christ is on the throne now. And that river flows from him upon us, anointing us, empowering us to be faithful and true witnesses. But not only upon us. When it flows from us, it flows upon the world. It's another flood. It covers the world. It covers the loss. Oh, I wish we could understand that this river could envelop the whole earth. We talk about Ezekiel 47 and we're going to see that this river could circle the whole earth flowing from one group, one little group of true believers in right relationship with God. This baptismal fount of the nature of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost could be flowing out of us. What does it do for the world? When it flows upon a lost soul, then the Holy Ghost have a place for his feet upon that lost soul to convict of sin. To convict that your problem is not what you do. The problem is who you are. To convict of sin. And then to convict of righteousness. This is righteousness. True righteousness. And see. Because he stands before God. As our righteousness. He got to convict the, the lost world of that. And then he convicts them. That of judgment. That the prince of this world. Has already been judged. That you don't have to wait. For a judgment to come. That it has already happening. And see, when somebody in the world really hears that, when they come to understand that, then there is an urgency. When you now speak the word that is spirit and life, the seed. See, inside the word of God is the seed of life. And when we speak it and the Holy Ghost has anointed, then that word enters in the very um, heart. And there it finds a place to grow. The word that you speak, your testimony, whatever it is. In this is the life. Remember now, we are filled with the spirit to overflow. Right? Right? The spirit of the living God is upon us. So everything that happens now through us, everything God works through us now, um, has, has the power of God, has the power of this life to overcome death. And so the world needs it. It needs it for this conviction. You remember that God has to move first. And see, so you could direct this prayer. It's so important under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you could direct this river where God desires it to go. 
not who we want to pray for, not what city we want to be saved to go, but as the Holy Ghost put in our heart, then we direct the prayer that the river flows. Remember the apostle Paul wanted to go to Asia and he said Satan hindered me out into Europe and, and, and the Holy Ghost won't let me. And then somebody says come over to Macedonia. Direct the river is flowing there. And there you're going to find fruitfulness. There you're going to find a harvest. Brothers and sisters, this, this spiritual river that needs to flow. The spiritual river, the Holy Ghost, flowing out of us, directed by God. And there we find fruitfulness. There we find labor. Why, why is that so important? If you go to Ezekiel 47, <laughs> and one of the things that it says in Ezekiel 47, talking about this movement of the Spirit of God in the age in which we live. It says, in this river, there were many fishes. The river itself, wherever it goes, it starts out when it leaves the door of the temple. And brothers and sisters, if we are here in right relationship with God, the river is flowing now. When we come here, we ought to be, you know, the Bible says that none could come unless the Spirit of God draws them. He has to do that work. But he says he flows so the world cannot receive him, but we have him. And the tragedy, I believe, is having him and him not flowing. The Spirit of God still brooding over the ruined creation as he did in Revelation and Genesis. Still brooding, no way through, can't find a way through the chaos and the darkness and the disorder for the glory of God. So all of you and me, in right relationship with God, this river now flows. And Ezekiel tells us, you know, it flows in stages um, dependent on the distance from the source. This is one thing that you would notice with the river, naturally. See, it, the mighty Mississippi might have started, I believe, in the mountains as just a little stream. But as it goes further and further, it becomes a mighty river that you can't stop. Now, Ezekiel says that the first time he was taken across the river, it came to his ankles. He says it took him a thousand feet, right? And then it was around his ankles. And then he took up another thousand and around his knees. And he took another thousand and is around his waist. Oh, brothers and sisters, that has so much meaning in it. And then he says he went another thousand and he couldn't cross. So no matter how small we are, I wish the people of God would understand that God's um, um, statement, the Lord's statement, that if two or three are gathered, there he is in the midst, that this promise blessedness, you know, one of the promise to Abraham was that in him, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. In his seed, which is Christ. Now, if Christ is in the midst of us, be it one or two or three, then out of that gathering, out of that, that union with him is flowing this river of life. And see, nobody can stop it. It might leave here a small stream that could be interrupted by all kinds of distraction. But boy, the further it goes, 
as the Holy Ghost directs, the more powerful it becomes. I wish as saints we would understand that if two of us in union with the risen exalted Lord is in prayer, the river flows wherever he directs and it does not matter the distance. See, the further it goes, the more powerful it becomes, the more impossible it is to stop it. So if you and your prayer partner uh, in the bedroom praying or in your secret place praying, maybe in the hills or the fields, and God directs the river to a remote place in Antarctica. Now you are here in the Bahamas praying, but the river is going to flow. And by the time it get there, if we don't give up, if we are persistent, he says the, 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 the prayer, right? The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous avail it much. If you and I here uh, in, in your prayer partner, in the secret place, praying in your closet, wherever it might be, and the river is directed to Antarctica there. By the time it gets there, if we don't give up, if we don't stop, if we are not disobedient, right? He says, man, are always to pray and not to faint. When that river gets there, if the source is still flowing here, then nobody can stop it. You wonder why revival break out here and there and there. And when somebody over there was praying, the river was flowing. This mighty river of the nature and the character of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You all with us this morning? You with us? See, the important thing is, is to be under the throne of God and of the Lamb. When we gather together that Christ Jesus the Lord has the preeminence, has the first place, that the Spirit of God has this liberty to flow, to go where to direct us to what we consider the most insignificant thing or what we consider great things. For God is not like that. If we are obedient and our prayer is in the power of the Spirit. See, the words that we are now given breath to, given life to, is the same word that God sent out. We are simply echoing it back to the throne. And he says it has to accomplish what he sent it out to do. Brothers and sisters, I want us to understand just the importance of coming together in the name of the Lord and having this river flow, this baptismal flood flow. Two or three of us in right relationship with God, yielded to the will of God, can be an instrument of God to change situation in the world. Amen. More powerful than the United Nations and all of its offices, agencies, is the saints in prayer. And this river flowing. You see, because wherever this river goes, the power of God falls. Even in going out to what we call witnessing, even in going out, the river needs to flow. It needs to be directed by God. You know, Ezekiel said, in this river, there was a lot of fish. And see, you fish in the river. You know, you don't fish on the banks. You don't fish on the other side of the bank, the dry land. No, 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 you no fish there. You fish, you throw your net in the river. That's where you throw your net. That is where the fishes are. 
You know, we said before, how silly it seems to be driving down the street and see a man with a line and hook, rod, throwing it in the street, trying to catch fish. Now, what you, you might catch one car, and I think the car can catch you. <laughs> you see what I mean? But in the river, where the river of life is flowing, there is multitude. There are multitudes of fishes. So often, we don't baptize our ministry in prayer. You need that baptism of the Spirit. You need that flow of the Spirit of God. We need the anointing of Christ upon us to empower us. And then we need to be obedient, persistent. Because the river starts as a little stream. And if you stop, the stream is going to dry up. But if you continue to pray, by the time the river gets back to you, you can't swim in it. It's so powerful. Amen. What are we saying about this baptismal fount? What are we saying about this river of life that is flowing, that makes everything alive where it goes? It might start in Nassau, end up in Cuba or Haiti, and all along the way, the Holy Ghost is just directing this river. It's stopping here. It's stopping there. It's passing through there. You know, you got two saints or one saint in a dry place by himself. God placed him there. And he's crying out to God, God, I need you to, to move in here. And you got two faithful saints over there praying to, 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 for this river to flow. And, 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 and as he prays, or the Holy Ghost say, let the river pass there. <laughs> let it pass by him. And then there is another little child over there crying in another land, crying out for mercy. And God says, well, let the river flow over there. Mind the river is going all the way to Haiti, but it's passing through all this little town. It's, it's meandering, and it's full of life. And the further it goes, the more powerful it becomes. Brothers and sisters, I just hope that God would, would give us a vision. See, by himself or herself out there praying, asking God to revive, asking God to, to, to send help. And, and, and God has put us in a comfortable place. God has given us the liberty and the time to intercede. And so as two begin to intercede, then the river begins to flow. And if you don't stop, God just keep, the Holy Ghost just keeps sending this river. You mention this name and that name and that places and you don't know why. God says, let me take a little turn there. I got, I got one little saint there who's been there for 30 years by themselves. And he's seen you no know, fruitfulness yet. Remember part of this order of Christ is fruitfulness. And not a river passes by. You know we sang, pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. There's somebody in Venezuela. There's somebody in Arizona. There's somebody in London crying out, Lord, let the river flow. Let the river pass by me. And God says, I can't find too faithful person. I can't find an intercessor. He says, I look and I can't find nobody who will just stay and, and in prayer and, and, and hold on to the horns of the altar until the river reaches that lonely soul, that desolate place. We're talking about sending people here and sending people there. Send the river. Send the river. Let the river flow. Let it flow. There is light where the river flow. You say send the light or where the river is. Oh, brothers and sisters, we got a privilege. We got the honor 
as God has given us some rest and some peace to intercede, to cry out until he shows up. And when the river start flowing out of us, say, God, that ain't enough. You got to come down and anoint so I could keep on going. And when that river leave your little prayer meeting, when that river leave your little place over there in Virginia, when it leaves, it touches, it touches, the Holy Ghost just say, here and here. He said, the wind blow, blow it where it lists. It's just here and there. And all along the way, it's bringing life. All along the way, somebody's thirsty soul could drink. It can go through deserts. The deserts cannot stop it now. It is so powerful. And so Satan works so hard to discourage, to discourage us with barrenness, with dryness, to discourage you because he can't do nothing about this river. It's the river of God flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now, I want to encourage you and I today, brothers and sisters. God has given us a little space, a door of opportunity. God has opened a door so that river could flow. We know some people in Peru. We know some people in Cuba and Santo Domingo. We know some situation in Costa Rica. We know some situations in Auckland and Maguana. We know some situation right down the street. Get together. You got some children, so it seems impossible to reach. Well, you're trying to fish for them on dry land. It's impossible. The river needs to flow. We need to ask God to open this baptismal fount. We need God to come and, 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 and quicken us. And, and we need to pray for it all over the world. See, when you could imagine a river, two saints in, in, in the Bahamas and then two in the United States. And God decided to let those two rivers meet and join up with one heart and one mind. Now you have something that could cover the earth. We say that the earth will be covered with the knowledge of God. Like the waters covers the sea. But brothers and sisters, we don't need a great crowd to do that. We don't need a, a, a million dollars to do that. All we need to be is faithful. It's when God touches us and lay on us a spirit of prayer and intercession, of grace and intercession, we yield to it and we keep on praying. We keep until the power falls. And when the power falls, you know the river has gone out. There is life there. There is light. There's the order of God. It breaks barriers. These, these barriers that, that Satan has set up, these religious doctrines and all that stuff that we're trying to fight with words. No, no, no. God says, let the river flow. It breaks all those boundaries that set, try to, to separate God's people. It just destroyed them. You imagine a river over, even overflowing its banks? It's this river that needs to flow. And it flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flows from the temple of God. And it grows as God directs. Brothers and sisters, I don't want us to feel small. Because the, the despise the day of small things. Because God is able to use those little things. Just two old ladies or two little children. God finds them and he lays a burden on them and he says, pray it through. And they pray and they pray and then the power falls 
But it's not just to make us feel good to see something happening right around us. God wants that same river now to flow. He wants to erect it to this country, to this people, to that nation, to that land. And it could start with two persons. God brings somebody alongside. If it's just you, God brings somebody alongside. You say, now I have the adequate witness. And the life starts to flow. Yeah, you might see a little movement inside your congregation. Glory to God. But remember, the further the river goes, the deeper it gets. So this morning, when we think about the great commission to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, don't let con Satan confuse us with modes of baptism. That's not what he fears. He don't fear whether you put him in a basin or you put him in the sea. It doesn't matter to him. What scares him is when the true baptism of a fount start to flow. That scares him because he can't do anything about it. The Bible says wherever it go, if it goes in the valleys, if it goes in the desert, it goes in the city, wherever it goes, you can be sure that there is life. And then in the river, it's just full of fish, wherever it goes. You cast in your net. You know, you say, oh boy, there's a great revival happening in Cuba. What happened? Wait, well, somebody was praying and the river reached Cuba. And you know, somebody say, well, I heard it reached Cuba. Lord, let it pass by, by, by New York or Moscow or, or Tokyo, you know, or Shanghai. Let, let the river flow, God. Let it flow. And, and, and the Holy Ghost look and say, okay, well, I can bypass a, 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 a Moscow, but I can pass by Washington. And then the people in, Bos in, in Moscow say, Lord, what happened to us? What about us? Or the Holy Ghost say, okay, I can, I can turn the river back. The river can double back. You see, ever see how the river flows? Brothers and sisters, God has given a promise for these last days, these last times. God has given a promise that the reapers will overtake the plowmen. He says, as soon as Zion travails, it brought forth children. God wants to do something. I, it is something waiting to burst forth on this earth. There's something waiting to, 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 to be revealed. It's like the cloud of glory is just over us, just hovering over us, and the rain wants to come down. The clouds want to burst and let rivers flow. The earth wants to open up its mouth and bring forth the fruit of righteousness. He says it will spring forth righteousness and truth. It means if it's springing, you're working to build it. It's springing its life. Oh, if God could only move on our hearts. If God could only move on, on some hearts that won't faint, that won't get weary if it's just a small stream in the midst of the congregation. It's trying to get out. It, it, it trying to get out. It trying to touch some some prison. It trying to touch some 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 person who is 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 is, is weary. It, it's trying to reach somebody calling. Come over to, 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 to Israel and help us. And the river flows. And then the anointing comes down on that river. And the power of God is changing life. You want revival? Let the river flow. So many people are crying out, oh God, revive us, revive the nation. And God says, I am not principally interested in that. I want to bring in this kingdom of righteousness. God wants to bring in the kingdom, the everlasting kingdom. And for that, the whole earth needs to be anointed. Oh, I wish we could understand that. It's good to have a great movement of God. 
it's better to have the kingdom of righteousness coming in forever to get rid of all the stuff that was done but for that we need the river to flow and it flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb. There's a scripture that says, deep calling unto deep. You know, the fountains of the deep are broken up. That's inside you and me. There's another flood that God is looking for. Let the heavenly dove have a place for his feet to strengthen the saints to the witness that is faithful and the testimony that is true. To convict the world unto the great transition. We want something that is going to last forever. It's good if God do a work here and there. It's good for another Azusa Street. Well, bless the Lord. But we want that river to keep flowing until the whole earth is covered. Until the whole earth and then the kingdom comes. Till the heavenlies are cleansed. You know our great high priest opens rivers of living waters in the heavenlies. And that meets the river that is flowing from the church. Oh, blessed Lord, if we only understood how God uses the little things. That little trickle of water that is now the mighty uh, uh, Mississippi. That little trick of water that is now the mighty Amazon. It starts just with a little flow. A little melting of the glacier. Melting of our coldness. Melting of our lukewarmness. A little melting and the river begins to flow. And then God directs it. Oh God say now I got what I want. They're not just praying for revival to come in South Africa. They're not just praying for revival to come in Asia. They're praying that the river flows and covers the whole earth. That the cloud of the presence is upon the whole earth. That this number that no man could number comes forth. What is your responsibility and mine? Is as God touches, we yield. No matter what it looks like, brothers, the conflict is great. Remember we said that in every one of those realms, there is conflict. But brothers, once that river starts to flow, once that life breaks forth, the further it goes, the more powerful it becomes. Dedicate yourself to the Lord, to the kingdom of God, and watch this little stream that's flowing from here. Oh, I, I just, I sense great and wonderful things. I really sense um, one little stream from out of the traditional Baptists, out of the Pentecostals, out of the non-denominational. One little stream, two or three people strategically planted. This remnant that God has promised now in tone, in touch, in union with the throne and the word of God going back to God and accomplishing everything that God wants it out to do. And then they're joining up. All this little stream joining up. And the enemy is confused. He's wondering what is happening. Well, those Christians have finally caught the vision. That the anointing falls where the river flows. That the power of God unto life is deposited in us. And those two or three who God would make faithful. We just hope today that the Lord would have quickened us to our responsibility. Do not despise the day of small things. God is doing something marvelous. Father, we give you thanks and praise for your word. We thank you, Lord, that the river now flows, that the Holy Ghost now directs, 
and that it brings life everywhere it goes, Lord. It brings life. There's a multitude of fish that your servants on both banks of the river are casting in net, blessed Lord Jesus, and reaping a mighty harvest for the living God. God, you promise a remnant witness to the truth in every land, and Lord, send them forth. We are calling them forth, Lord God, in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost this morning. Lord, we are calling them forth to come forth, Lord. Those who you've caught, those who you've hidden for this time, oh, Holy Ghost, bring them forth now, Lord, that the world might know that our God still reigns today. We thank you now and we bless you and praise you in the name of the Lord Jesus for the glory of God. We thank you, Father. Be glorified. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon us. The Lord lift up his covenant countenance upon us and minister grace to all who would hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.